So the alchemy of product development. Um, you might, I, I feel like you might think, Henry, what are you talking about? Product development's food science, right? Um, but really, it's so much more than that. There's um, so many qualitative aspects to it. And with data and science, we can look at what's already happened, and we can look at what's happening right now to predict what's about to happen. Um, but there's really no silver bullet to it. So I'm going to go ahead and real quick run through just high level the levers that I tend to pull throughout the ideation process. So once you have this data, or even before you have the data, what are you supposed to do with it? Um, so the first part of the ideation cycle uh, is setting intent as a researcher. I think a lot of entrepreneurs, when you have an idea, it's almost like a child was born. You love it. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, you have such an attachment to it. And it, it means so much to us, but it's really important to be able to look at research with this unbiased approach. Um, so that's always the first thing that I try to start with. Sometimes you're researching to validate an idea that you already had. Sometimes you're researching to find entirely new ones. So the first part of the step is to research and connect the dots. Once you're conducting research and you're connecting the dots, you start to put things together and have original and spontaneous ideas. And the more you, that you go through this process and the more that you can start to recognize these patterns, the more frequently that you're gonna be able to have original and spontaneous ideas. So the way that I use this research at, as a part of that cycle started actually, like the whole philosophy behind how I started um, this concept was actually with a jazz guitar lesson. So I sat down with the instructor and I was like, I just do not get music theory or like how to improvise with music. It seems like so complicated and abstract. And he said something to me that really resonated and I took it with me and think about it now in just about everything that I do. And he said, Henry, music at its most simple definition is the organization of sound. Nice. And that, that like really hit home for me. And I feel like you can apply that to just about anything in your life. So being able to take data and organize it in whatever ways make sense to you. There is no right or wrong way to do it. And I think that you'll see that in the product development process as well. Everyone tends to have their own way of doing things. And so there's something that you can learn from everyone in that cycle. So these are a few of the theories that I've put together based on that process. One is, well, I guess higher level, how, how do we organize flavor? Again, like such an abstract idea like music, you know, something that's impossible to kind of capture, right? But there is a way to do this. And um, these are a couple of the organizational tactics that I've used in flavor pairings when creating new products and things that I've observed over my career. So one of them is the Big Mac theory, right? So one of the most successful products of all time. Definitely not using any farm to table ingredients. <laughs> <laughs> um, but why does this resonate with people? Part of it's a great story, part of it's a great price point, but another part of it is being able to lay layer flavors in a way that excite every part, every sensory element of the palate. So when I think about the Big Mac, I think, you know, you've got this toasted bun, you've got this charbroiled patty, you've got this creamy, tangy sauce, you've got sour, crunchy pickles. And so there's so many different elements. Every time you bite down, it just like explodes in every different part of your mouth. And a lot of, I think a lot of chefs, as they're learning to take this approach of layering flavors, they layer too many. And so things get too complicated. And to me, the perfect dish, the perfect product, is being able to hit as many of those sensory elements and characteristics as you can while using the fewest number of ingredients. The next one is what grows together goes together. So that's, that's one that comes from the slow food movement and whether, regardless of what region you're in or what season you're in, different foods grow together and I don't know why, but for whatever reason, they all tend to pair really well together. So in the, in the spring, you'll find that spring, all the different spring produce and wild mushrooms and ramps, they 
all go together in a delicious way. Um, and the other one is a culinary, I call it culinary approach. Um, so how can you paint a picture with colors that, that can create different flavor profiles? So when I call a flavorist and I'm trying to order a flavor sample, I'll say, I'm looking for a strawberry flavor. I want a rich, juicy red strawberry. And they'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But, or I might be looking, I might not be looking for a juicy red strawberry. I might be looking for something that's not quite ripened yet. So I might describe the flavor as being green and seedy. So I'm looking for a different profile. Even though we're still talking about strawberries, the nuances of those flavors are oftentimes described by color. So if you look at a flavor wheel or you look at a color wheel and you pair the colors with the flavors, you can find that for whatever reason, colors that go together also match with flavors that go together. So red strawberries tend to go with other red colored foods that all go together. So that's my, that's my culinary approach. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so how do we use AI as a part of this organizational process to get there faster? The first three of these tiles up here, AI speeds us right through. So usage occasions, different emotions, what are the trending flavors we should be looking at and using, global trends. We already talked about scraping social media, which is something that I do, used to do <laughs> all the time. But now I sit down at TasteWise and I feel like I'm at the mothership. I've got all these different windows open and I'm able to pull from Pinterest and TikTok and look at data spikes and zoom in on different regions. And it's just so much faster than looking through my Google search history and trying to remember what website I saw the last cool thing on. <laughs> so it's a great resource to speed right through those first three uh, bullets right there as we look for a product to market fit. The next one is manufacturing platforms. I find so many great ideas and one of them we're going to talk about in a few minutes by flipping the script on manufacturing platforms. You might find something, say, a savory platform that works so well for sweet or a sweet platform that just hasn't had a chance in a, a savory snacking environment yet. And one of them we're going to talk about a little bit. Um, the other one is shopper data, supermarket comps, being able to see where people are going in the store is really important to making sure that your product is successful. You might have a great product, but if it's not in front of your customer or a part of their shopper profile in the store, it's not going to work. I think that that's one of the mistakes that um, a lot of plant-based meats made going to market. Um, they were positioning themselves in the deli department. I don't know any vegans that go to the <laughs> deli department. <laughs> they're all in the produce area. So how are people gonna find your product once they're in the store? So being able to look at shopper category data and comps and understanding the buyer decision is a huge part of how we're gonna get a great product to fit in the store. And then lifespan of a product. So. When, when does your customer use it? How long do they use it for? I'm not gonna sell infant formula to Charisse. No, <laughs> she doesn't need it. <laughs> so understanding the lifespan of your product and who it's meant for and at what point in their life is incredibly important. Um, consumer sent sentiment can play a big role in that as well. Um, different ingredients come and flavor profiles, they fall in and out of favor all the time. So when I'm thinking about a great product that is gonna stand the test of time on the shelf, I think about what is a great platform first because you need something that's gonna be able to adopt to an evolving landscape over time. Um, and then barrier to entry is a huge part of that as well. And that's a part of the reason that I wanted to look at a gummy as a part of this demo. So a gummy is a good example of something that there's a lot of available manufacturing. And there's a ton of different functional ingredients that you can add to it 
there's a ton of different flavor profiles that you can test, low volumes, easy to get into market, shelf stable. Um, so you can, you can test easily without spending millions of dollars on a beverage line to be able to test if, you know, guayasa tea extract, which I'm actually gonna put in this gummy, makes and, sense in a beverage. <laughs> and I, there are some gummy samples upstairs today as well, and they're vegan. Oh, interesting. So see, so gummy Yeah, we've got some samples too, so stick around. Um, and then you wanna fill a need. Um, and that's not just for your customer, but I also feel like that's for me. I wanna feel like I'm doing something to improve this world that I'm a part of. And being able to fill a need with, with a customer and make the world a little bit better is a part of what drives the values of all these great products and brands. So these are the concepts. Inspired by the ideation that we did using almonds and using TasteWise data, we came up with three, I think, really unique concepts. And not all of them were necessarily outlined in the, what was trending with TasteWise. But if you look at the beginning of the ideation cycle, that's not what's important. What's important is learning. And learning and pattern recognition and being able to see what is a potential opportunity in the market. So we have a ton of different tools. TasteWise and AI is one of them. And then we're still gonna look at our other tools and blend everything together to create incredible products. And I think that's what the human, when we were talking earlier about that human element. So you have the data insights, but you take, you know, Chef Henry's experience to put the human element into that and develop these three amazing products, which I have a favorite I've been snacking on. I won't tell you which one is my favorite, <laughs> but they really are delicious. And I'm glad that you came up with those items. Thank you, Sharice. I appreciate it. Um, so the first one that we're going to look at is inspired by uh, Chamoy Mango Nada. Um, so I took a platform that I think has been overlooked for a long time. I'm sure you've seen those wafer tubes and the big tins in the, in, this, in the international aisle of the supermarket that you try to avoid buying because you eat the entire tin. Um, and so this is inspired by that. So we took a chamoy spiced almond butter and filled them in a wafer tube and then enrobed a part of the tube um, and dusted it with chopped nuts and uh, dried mango. So this, yeah, those are the samples right there, enjoy. Um, and then the next one that we did is a, an almond miso chili crisp. I've been incredibly frustrated with the, with the chili crisps that have been coming to market because they all seem to be exactly the same. <laughs> and I feel like it's one of those platforms that are low barrier of entry into market, easily can be used with many different flavor profiles, and a great use for almonds as well. So this is one that we did with a, um, a miso, almond butter, chili oil, and we also used some uh, almond skins for extra texture in the crunch. So are any of the two that you mentioned so far, are they vegan friendly? What are the attributes? Yeah, so all of them are vegan friendly, um, as the, I, aside from the uh, the, with or, organic sugar. Oh, nice. Yeah, but otherwise everything can be, can be plant-based. Um, and then the, the gummies as well uh, were a, an almond milk and honey gummy using a guayasa tea extract for a little bit of an extra energy boost. So we wanted to take that idea and use it as a showcase for um, trending flavors, being different forms of functionality. And then what's also unique about this formulation is most gummies, you either have gelatin or you have pectin. And gelatin is great, um, but it's not plant-based. Pectin also, great texture, but it reacts with pH, so you have to have acidity to it. This gummy is neither. This gummy was made using a blend of locust bean gum and agar. So you can get one that has a great texture that's very similar to pectin, but it doesn't need to be so acidic. So that gave us the ability to showcase um, a little bit more kind of 
sweet and mellow flavors like milk and honey. Okay, so I'm crunching, but what do you think so far? <laughs> <laughs> so, without further ado, I will uh, show you exactly how we made the mango nada pocky stick right now. Had any of you ever tried like a pocky stick or a, um, a crisp before? Yeah. So using, you know, Emily talked about the 14 forms of almonds that we have, and that's what you really see. So we take the insights from TasteWise. We look at the various forms. Do you want to use flour, oil, almond butter, you know, the various forms, and then put something together. But I absolutely love the fact I'm vegan. So the fact that I get to taste it, try it, and utilize almonds really appeal to me. So the wafer in the tube for the chamoy stick uses um, defatted almond flour as a part of the base, which is a part of the upcycling proposition that we've been discussing as, as trending in the industry. So we've got defatted almond flour, um, sugar, and all-purpose flour. And then I'm gonna use aquafaba, which is recently an industrialized ingredient. It's something that's been used in home kitchens a lot, but really hasn't had an opportunity in the industrial market yet. Um, so this is one of, and I found out about it actually by um, reformulating a barista milk during, <laughs> right when the war in Ukraine happened. So when the war in Ukraine started, there was a shortage of sunflower lecithin, and we needed to find a way to reformulate the milk for the, for the new environment. And we tested a bunch of different like starches and all sorts of things to try and stabilize the barista milk, but then also keep the foaming um, when, a, when a, a barista was using it. And one of the ingredients that we found most effective because of the way that the proteins are folded after the cooking process of chickpeas. Um, it not only replaced the lecithin instability during the aseptic process, but then also had great foaming properties in the cafes. So that's when I started working with aquafaba and I, I used it in um, what's basically a waffle cone batter right now. Most of the waffle cones that you find on the market, actually pretty much all of them except for the cake cones, are they use egg whites. Um, so this is an example of one that can be used using just aquafaba. Any questions you have so far? Just an observation on the, um, the chili crisp. I remember seeing prior to like the emergence of all the popular products, there was a Chinese product that would come in a large jar, and there was like heavies of peanuts in it. So it was like red roasted chili, oil. I was telling Sharice, if someone doesn't commercialize that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to commercialize it. <laughs> yeah, that's my favorite. That, my favorite is the manganata. Like, I love that. I like tart the best. It's, it's tarty, yeah. I mean, I love tart, but this, I mean, you could commercialize that. I think, like that. exactly. And you're, you guys are all in the majority. Everyone thinks that it should be commercialized for certain. And the texture, you like the texture? <laughs> so while that's working, while that's working, uh, I'm going to work on the, the filling that you guys tried in that wafer tube. And that starts with... Did everyone get the gummy as well yet or no? What did you think about the gummy? The cleanse. Give the cleanse. <laughs> You like it? Oh, yeah. The gummy is your favorite? Well, I like all three. I like the texture of the gummy. Some gummies, they really stick to your tooth. Maybe because I'm older, I don't know. But this feels really good. 
in terms of not being extra sticky. But the manganata definitely is my favorite. So the challenge with um, making a chamoy spiced almond butter is that it is a water and oil emulsion, uh, which can be very difficult to formulate. Um, and a part of the way that we get uh, the water-based chamoy concentrate to emulsify into the almond butter as a filling uses some mono and diglycerides. And the mono and diglycerides use is actually shearing fat. So you're able to cut down the fat molecules into smaller droplet sizes. And this allows the fat to actually accept more water into the base. So that's how we're able to get a chamoy concentrate to emulsify into a fat-based system, which is otherwise very difficult to do. So a, a big part of the challenge, too, is trying to get everything to be shelf-stable, obviously. Um, and in certain applications, like the chamoy stick, um, almond butter chamoy stick, uh, there's three different elements that you have to keep in mind. So you've got the filling, the wafer. It should be ready. More than ready. <laughs> And so you want to um, you want to make sure that the water activity matches throughout the entire product. So the filling, uh, in order to be crispy, it needs to be under a water activity of 0.6. Um, and so the filling, the wafer, and the outer part all need to have the same water activity. If you have something on the inside that's a higher moisture content, then it'll start to um, permeate through the outer parts and you'll get something that's quite soft. So I guess, Chef Henry, I know some, I really like the manganata and I like the flavor, but there are different things you can do to it. Like it doesn't have to have that tanginess. We can make it more sweet, make it, you know, include chocolate. There are other options that you can use for that format. Yeah, you can make it a dreamsicle if you wanted and put some orange flavoring on the inside and dust dried orange and and toasted almonds on the outside if you wanted to. Or the new lemon. I know we didn't get to it. The How do you pronounce it? The Filipino, um, the calamansi. <laughs> you know, so there are a lot of different things that you can do in terms of if, if this filling didn't appeal to you, there's so many other options. But what the trends are saying is that a Pocky stick in some form, whether you call it a Pocky stick or not, could be trending, um, you know, in 2024. Yeah, and I think on a higher level in general, each one of these platforms is exactly that. It's a platform. So then whatever is trending, you can plug into it. And so these are just interesting platforms that I've found are underutilized. Like the Chili Crisp, it's just it's so frustrating to see this one Chili Crisp on the market all the time. The, the wafer tubes, I see them in the international aisle all the time. Why hasn't someone done something with this yet? So these are just interesting platforms that I think are ripe for new innovation, and that's where you can take taste-wise trends and data and the nutrition power of, of almonds and make some really interesting snacks. Well, thank you. I know we kept you for a while, but thank you. Chef Henry is going to continue if you have any other questions, but we really appreciate you um, staying here to hear the presentation. The Almond Board, we have a lot of research. So if you take that card, you look at the QR code, feel free to contact us if you're looking for specific information. We could help you with that. But thank you for coming, and um, feel free to share. And I think this information, this session, will be uploaded um, as well. Yeah, so thank you. Terrible. Oh, for sure, for sure. You can. Yeah. I know. I have some more samples here as well that I'm trying. <laughs> so thank you guys for coming. Thank you. All right. Thank you.